Open your Bible, if you will, to the book of Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And I began a three-part series last week entitled Eyes Wide Open. And if you're our guest, I would encourage you in the bulletin that you receive, there are notes, and I would encourage you to follow along with that. I want to begin uh, this morning by... Uh, by giving just a quick review, not of the whole thing, but just to kind of uh, vector in so that we understand uh, what Paul is saying in these verses and how our life fits into it. I begin with three introductory statements, and I put it in the personal pronoun I, because as you read it, I want you to think about yourself. First introductory statement is this, the day I was saved was not the end, it was only the beginning. Whatever that day was that you came to know Christ, that was not the end, That's not, that wasn't an end all be all, that was a, uh, it's like this, you know, our, our life, if you were to study the first, uh, first John. John talks about two relationships that we have with the Lord, with God. The first one is sonship. That comes by a once and for all uh, transaction. Uh, when we come to the place to where we realize that we are lost and on our way to hell, and the only way we can get to heaven, the only way we can get into a right relationship with God is to accept what God did on our behalf. The only way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. So the fact that Jesus died on the cross and paid the penalty of our sin, that he shed his blood that our sin could be forgiven. Now listen, you can go any route you want to go other than that and you'll go straight to hell. The only way you get to heaven is by accepting God's gift. You see, for God so loved the world that he gave. And so the first relationship that we have with God is sonship. And when that takes place, listen, nobody can change it. I have a sonship relationship with God, and nothing and no one can alter that. One iota. I'm his child, but there is another relationship that we have with God that's not a once and for all, it's a day-by-day -day relationship. It's, a, it's our fellowship with him. And so the moment we get saved, that's not the end. It's the beginning. Number two, we need to understand, my life will be full of transitions, we need to understand because some transitions are great, man. We love them. They put goosebumps on us and other transitions they are not so good. We don't enjoy. Some we enjoy, some we don't enjoy. You see, the Christian life, God said, is going to be like this. It's going to be hills and valleys. There are going to be times you're going to be on a mountaintop. You are, man. Life is going to be as good as it's ever been or better. And there are other times that God will allow or appoint something to happen, and we plummet into the valley. Don't think that you get to the valley because you sin. There are times that God, again, He will allow or He will appoint something to happen. And you know, one of the reasons why is that I think most of us, I know myself, when you get down in the valley, when there's nowhere to look up but to look up, when you get in utter desperation, uh, that's where some real growth takes place. Now, growth takes place on the mountaintop too. But just understand this, that your life is going to be full of transitions. It just is. It's a fact. So we need to understand that. And secondly... Not only is, will my life 
uh, will be full of transitions, but my life is to be full of transformation. Full of transformation. Let's look at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and that's where we're going to be for, we were there last week and we'll be there today and we'll also be there next week. I told you last week, I wish someone would have sat me down early in my Christian life and explained to me all that I'm going to talk about in these three weeks. It's not rocket science, but it is transformational. Um... I'm not omniscient, but I will tell you that probably more Christians that I have known over my entire span of knowing Christ, as many, their life is not full of transformation. And you see, that's totally dependent upon your desire to follow what God says. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Let me just say that again. I beseech you therefore, brethren. So this is going to believers. This isn't, this is God is coming to his kids. Paul is saying, I beseech you, I beg you, therefore, brethren. Remember, whenever you read that word, therefore, in a scripture, you got to go back and see, why did God, why is that therefore? What's it there for? He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, but we all with unveiled face. The veil is off. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed. There's that word, transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. You see that word transform both in Romans 12 and 2 Corinthians 3 is where we get our English word metamorphosis, a total change from a cocoon to a butterfly. That's what happens. The moment we get saved, God begins the process from there. Of We've been regenerated. We, we've been saved. We've been forgiven. We've been accepted in the beloved. We've been adopted into God's forever family. And by the way, when you, what it means is that even though we're a babe in Christ, we've been adopted. The moment you get saved, even though you're a babe in Christ, God gives you a spiritual checkbook. He gives you adult standing and says, come boldly before my throne. It's all open to you. All that I have for you is available. Just meet me on my terms. In other words, like I said last week, that a simple way to understand how transformation, it's when the child of God looks into the Word of God, the Spirit of God transforms him into the likeness of the Son of God. Look here. If your Bible is closed... I, I, I'm not suggesting that you don't like it. I'm not suggesting that you're, you're living like the devil. But I'm saying, if in your life, day after day, for the most part, week after week, you come to church, but your Bible's closed, you can take this truth to the bank. You will never be transformed. You may have sonship, but you're not going to have good fellowship. You see, fellowship is based on a a day-by-day relationship with the Lord. And transformation takes place, first and foremost, by understanding who God is, what He's like. And so when the child of God gets into the Word of God, 
the Spirit of God transforms them into the likeness of the Son of God. I put in your notes, the universal will of God for every believer is to be more like Jesus. That's why in Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul wrote, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Now, there are four words, and I put this in your notes, there are four words that compel the surrender of my life to God. Look here. When I learned this truth, everything else began to fall into place. These four words compelled me to surrender my life to him. And here they are, the mercies of God. I love that first, I love that, that, that the translation, one of the translations of Romans 12, 1, that begins with eyes wide open to the mercies of God. With eyes wide open to the mercies of God. We get so caught up in ourselves, in our life, and all this, what's going around here. But God is saying, open your eyes wide, man, to my mercies. Because when you come to grips with that, listen, God didn't save us and then leave us to live the rest of our lives however we wanted to. He knows what he wants from each and every one of us, and he's calling us to look more like Jesus each and every day. And there's only one way, listen, there's only one way to do that, and that's a radical abandonment to God. That's exactly what Paul is saying here. In Romans chapter 12 and 1, uh, 1 and 2, you can just think of it this way. Paul is calling us, on behalf of God, to a radical abandonment. Paul had a radical abandonment to God, and he's calling Ken, he's calling you, to a radical abandonment to God. So last week, we took the first part of verse number one. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Now watch this. With our eyes wide open to the mercies of God, then and then alone can we begin to understand and come into agreement with what else Paul is saying in verse number one. And so let's pick it up here. The first part, number one, Paul says that you present your bodies. And there's a key word here. I'll give you a key word for every part. And the key word is entire. Let me say a couple things about this. First of all, we are to present our entire person. You see, when Christ redeemed you, he redeemed all of you. God gave all in Christ and he demands all in return. Are you listening? Your marriage, your children, your occupation, your dreams. Your aspirations. God wants all of that to be presented to him. I put in your notes. The body, because what Paul says, he says that you present your bodies. The body is the outer shell that houses the entire person. So when... when when Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, he says, that means, can I want everything, everything about you, because your body houses everything about you. I put in your notes in that box, Abraham Kuyper, former prime minister of the Netherlands, said, and I quote, there is not an inch within the whole area of human existence which Christ, the sovereign of all, does not cry, it is mine. Look here. 
Everything about me, let me just use myself as an example, everything about me, my mind, my will, my emotions, my marriage, my family, my church, everything, everything about me is his. And God says, if you want to be transformed, Ken, if you want to know what it is, to become more like Jesus, here is what you have to do. Now, Ken, you're going you're gonna to get a lot of uh, cat calls. You're going to get a lot of signals from the world, even from other Christians. And they're going to tell you this, that, and the other, and they've got their five-step formula. Ken, I'm telling you, here's what you do. You have to present your body. Everything. And give it to me. Secondly, you must literally make a present of your life to God. Uh, I, uh, anybody that knows me knows I, I love the holidays. I love Christmas and, and, and getting presents for, uh, uh, the, for Deb and, and the family. And the, yeah, I, and I, we, so we've got these presents, and I watch Deb, and she wraps those presents so meticulously, and she... She does a great job. I can tell any present under a tree that is not wrapped by her. She just does it. And I remember looking at that tree. I don't know when it was. It could have, for all I know, it could have been 20 years ago. But I remember looking at that present, and I thought, that's what God wants from me. He, he, he doesn't... He doesn't he doesn't require that I wrap myself up as pretty as Debbie does a present. He just wants me to make a present of myself to him. You see, God asks my best, but he requires my all. He just wants me to present myself. Make a present of ourself to God. Reminds me of the chicken and the pig that were walking down the road and they saw a billboard that said, feed the poor. And the chicken said, that's a good idea. Let's do it. Let's you and I create a ham and a ham and egg breakfast. And the pig says, I don't know about that. For you, it's a contribution. For me, it's a total commitment. Yeah, that's funny. It is. But the sad thing is many people say, Lord, and here's how we live our Christian life. Lord, tell me what you want me to do, and I'll decide if I want to do it. If that's how you're living your life, you'll never live a life that's transformed. You're not becoming like Jesus. God says, don't ask me what it is and then you're going to decide if you want to do it. Listen carefully. You know, when it comes to the will of God, the plan of God, God only writes his will on a blank contract that you have already signed. Just give him a contract. Write nothing on it. Just sign it with no fine print. That's what it means to present your bodies. I put in your notes, presentation, presenting ours always. Say the word always. always. Presentation always comes before revelation. If you want God to reveal his plan, his will for your life, God, what should I do? Listen, the first thing you got to do is you got to present yourself. And then he says that you present your bodies, number two, a living sacrifice. Now, I just want you to hang with me on this one right here. There's a key word, and that word is, I, I put perpetual. And the word perpetual simply means continuing 
forever. As long as you live, it just continues, this thing of a living sacrifice. Now, the reality is, when we read that, that we present our bodies a living sacrifice, we go tilt. Because it's, it's, a, it's an oxymoron. Where an oxymoron is simply two words that are mutually contradictory, like a pretty ugly, working vacation, same difference. But you see, Paul said, you present your body, Ken, a living sacrifice. And when, listen folks, when you sacrifice something, you give up all possession and all ownership. Now, in the Old Testament, it's full of sacrifices all the way through. But in the Old Testament, it's, it's critical to understand that there was no such thing as a partial sacrifice. You don't find that. When a, when a, when a lamb was sacrificed... All the lamb was sacrificed, not just a leg. All the lamb was sacrificed. It was a total sacrifice. No strings attached. Because that's what God required. In the Old Testament, people would bring animals to the priest who would take that animal and the priest would kill it and place it on the altar on behalf of the person who brought it. And God says to us, that we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice. You see, there's a shift. Because now God demands two things. I put them in your notes. God demands two things. First of all, he demands the sacrifice. But secondly, he demands the sacrificer. Or underneath that in your notes, I put, you can say it like this in the Old Testament, God wanted the sheep. But in the New Testament, God wants the shepherd. Listen, understand this, when, when Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. The reason that he wants our body is this. If anything has your body, it has you. Think of that. If anything has your body, it has you. Remember our body houses the total us, our mind, our will, our thoughts, our emotions. In other words, what Paul is saying is this. Lay it on the altar, lay yourself on the altar, and abandon yourself totally to God. We're, you are to bring your life to God and totally abandon it to Him, taking your hands completely off and releasing all of your rights, all of your privileges that come with ownership. I don't know what else to call that, but radical abandonment. And I understand it's not a popular thing because we are so self-centered in our culture. It's about us. How can I get a job that makes this much money, the best, and this, that? And we're always thinking about us. And God understands that's what we live in. But God says, listen, I want, I want, I want radical abandonment to me. Put yourself on the altar. And then I'll take control of every aspect of your right life. You know, notice that Paul is specifically mentions that we're to present our bodies a living sacrifice because God wants to inhabit and control our bodies. He doesn't want dead animal carcasses today. He wants living human bodies 
which he can occupy and use for his glory. You know the reason I'm breathing right now? The same reason you're breathing. Listen, I use me as an example. God says, can the reason you're breathing today is because I want to occupy and use your life for my glory. It's not about you, Ken. It's all about me, God says. You see, the Bible teaches us that if you're born again, then your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And your body no longer belongs to you. But it belongs to God for his occupation and his glory. Just listen to this one. It won't be on the screen. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, Paul says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have from God and you are not your own, Ken. For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, because you've been bought with a price, because you're not your own, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The truth is, Jesus no longer lives on this earth in a physical body, folks. He lives on this earth in and through our physical bodies as he occupies our bodies with his spirit. We are the arms and the legs, the hands and the feet of Jesus in this world. Do you understand the extreme? I can't tell you anything but this because this is the truth. And the sooner we grasp it, the freer we become. Life begins, decisions begin, marriage, everything begins to take on a new dimension because we've placed ourselves and our bodies as a living sacrifice. Because God is calling us to completely surrender our lives over to him. A total release of all rights and all privileges and ownership to him. To radically and completely abandon ourselves to God. Folks, listen. This is radical stuff. It's not just, oh yeah, I think I'll do it. Or yes, and, you know. Now I lay me down to sleep. Kind of stuff. Paul said, I beg of you, brethren, this is the guy who had a radical abandonment to God. He said, I beg of you, Northwest Bible, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Just as in the Old Testament, when a priest would take that dead carcass and put it on the altar, on behalf of the one who gave it, God said, I still want the sacrifice, but now I want the sacrifice. Put yourself on the altar. A living sacrifice. You see, the key to victory and true happiness is not trying to get all that we can from God, but giving all all that we are and all that we have to God. That, that's why, I, I don't know, probably already always been here, but 30, 40 years ago, prosperity theology really started. I mean, it, it just, it, it fits right into the American way of life, you know, and, you know, do this, do this, and God will bless you and prosper you. And if you're really living for Jesus, you're going to, I mean, it's just, it's going to be wonderful. You know, you're going to have all the money you want, all of this you want. But then you come to this passage. You see, to understand that it's my life, my, our, our Christian life is not about getting all that we can from God. 
but it's giving all that we are and all that we have to God. The Lord demands, say the word demands. That's not good. Say it again. The Lord demands a total sacrifice of our life. Listen, every day. That's why he calls it a living sacrifice. I've been into a number of stores that are they have a you know that are going out of business. And I remember one time walking in, and there was this huge sign. As soon as I walked in, it said, "No returns, no refunds, all transactions final." That's what God is calling us to. That's the kind of sacrifice God wants from us. That's this, exactly the kind of sacrifice we're to offer to God. There was a British pastor many, many years ago who woke up every morning and he looked to heaven there from his bed and he would say the same thing every morning. Quote, Lord, this bed is my altar, this body is my sacrifice. As I arise to face the day until the moment I return, I offer my life as a sacrifice to you. I remember reading that many, many, many years ago, and I decided that before my feet would hit the floor every morning, I would just remind myself and offer myself again, Lord, I remember the day, not that I got saved, though I remember that, but I remember the day after I got saved, not the day after, but a period of time where I came to understand that the Christian life transformation only takes place when you place yourself as a living sacrifice. And so, Lord, before my feet hit the ground today, I just want you to know I'm yours and whatever you have for me, I know what I've got planned, but whatever takes place in the day, whether I know it's going to take place or when it comes out of left field, whether it's good, whether it's not so good, whether it's a great day like we'd love to have every day or whether there are some real difficulties that come, whatever it is, Lord, I want to honor you. I'm not my own. I'm yours. You bought me at Calvary. And I want to glorify you in every aspect of my life. That's the kind of sacrifice God wants from us. That's the way we're to start out every day. Number three, he continues and he says that we're to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. And the key word there is clean. You know, under the old covenant, the sacrificial animal had to be without spot and without blemish. And you know what? That physical purity symbolized the spiritual and moral purity that God requires of the offerer himself. It's like when you get to Psalm 24, the worshiper it's how he, he's supposed to come to God, how he comes. Psalm 24, 4, he who has clean hands and a pure heart. That's how we come before God. In the book of Malachi, the old, last book in the Old Testament, the Lord rebuked those who were sacrificing animals that were blind or had a, other, uh, otherwise were impaired. And in Malachi chapter 1 and verse 8, When you offer the blind as a sacrifice, as a sacrifice, is, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably? You see, these people were willing to give a second-rate offering to God. one that they would never think of giving to a government official for taxes or to whatever. Jesus, on an occasion, was with the disciples, with Peter particularly, 
uh, he attempted to wash Peter's feet, and Peter just kind of, you know, politely rebuked the Lord by saying, no way. I, I just, in, in John 13, in verse 8, Peter said to Jesus, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash your feet, you have no part with me. You see, what God was intending us to see from that, it's not just the physical feet that the Lord was talking about, but as we walk through this dirty world, we daily need to come that he might purify us. And when Peter understood that, Peter's reply was, Lord, go ahead and wash my feet, but also can you wash my hands and my head and everything, God? I'm yours. And then he ends verse number one. Paul has written, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. And then he ends, which is your reasonable service. God doesn't want us to be like the chicken making a contribution. God wants us to have a total commitment to him. The key word, the, this might surprise you, it, the key word is logical. You see, the word reasonable comes from the Greek word logikos, is where we get our English word logic. And what it means is this, folks. Listen carefully. It means offering ourselves to God, put our, putting our bodies on that altar as a living sacrifice because the body house is everything that we are. Putting ourselves on that altar. It means that's a reasonable thing to do. It's rational. It's logical. In other words, Paul is saying, if you will only stop and think about it, in light of who God is and what he has done for us, that is the only reasonable, logical, rational thing to do. James Montgomery Boyce, former pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church said this concerning this passage, and I quote, if you and I were as rational as we think we are and sometimes claim to be, we would not need any encouragement to offer our bodies to God as living sacrifices because it would be the most reasonable thing in the world for us to do. God is our creator. He has redeemed us from sin by the death of Jesus Christ. He has made us alive with Christ. He loves us and cares for us. It is reasonable to love God and to serve him in return. But what is interesting is that that phrase, present your bodies, is in the aorist tense, which simply means that it is rooted to a point in time. It doesn't mean that it can't be renewed, but it means there is a, if I could put it this way, a climactic moment in our life, a defining moment in our life when we come to grips and we understand that the only way to live the Christian life, God demands that the Christian life be lived this way, is to put our body on the altar as a living sacrifice. And the idea is a once-in-time commitment that will affect the rest of your life. And folks, 
The problem today is we want a few points and a few stories, and we want to feel good when we leave church, and we want everything to be just apple pie and ice cream. And the problem, we wind up like James talks about, double-minded, driven with the waves and tossed. And God says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, put your name in there, by the mercies of God, because of all that he's done, he saved you, he forgave you, he redeemed you, he regenerated you, he accepted you in the beloved, he's adopted you. You're sealed. Your soul is sealed under the day of redemption. And so I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your body. I got to tell you, I struggled with that for a long time. I, I knew what it meant. I had it all in my mind, but... I just, something, I, I just, I mean, it's like, yeah, you know, uh, pretty ugly. Government organization. Well, shouldn't have said that. Anyway, <laughs> I don't mean that. Could be said about us. And then one day, early in my Christian life, I was performing a marriage, a wedding ceremony. And I thought to myself, you know what happens at a wedding ceremony? A young couple makes vows to each other. They make a once and for all commitment to the other person. But we all know that it takes more than a wedding to make a marriage, don't we? Because once that couple takes that enormous step of commitment in their wedding, they have to recommit themselves to those vows every day of their lives. And show me a couple that does that, and I'll show you a couple that's growing together, becoming more like each other, enjoying life, fully coming to comprehend what love is all about. It would never have happened if they hadn't made that once and for all commitment. And when I saw that, the lights came on. And for the first time, I really understood what Paul was saying. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, look at it. I beseech you, Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present, present, that word present, it's like the ceremony. It's like making those vows to your spouse at the altar, that you present your body a living sacrifice. Wholly acceptable to God. Which is the most reasonable, rational thing to do. The devil comes in and he wants to scare us and say you live like that, you'll be an abject failure. And God says the only way you'll be successful in this Christian life, I'm calling you to radical abandonment. Folks, the days have always been dark. But the Bible tells us that it's going to get darker and darker and darker and darker the closer we get to the return of Christ. And only the Father knows 
when that will take place. Only God. Jesus doesn't know when God's going to say, go get my children. Only God knows. But if we think things are dark today, I, I mean, you know, in my short life of 49 years, why are you laughing? I mean, somebody may be watching this who's never watched a service before. But anyway, in my life, where, where am I going with this? I know where I was going, but then I, y'all laughed and got me off. Uh, when I was a child growing up, I was like any other kid who was living at that time, but society was different. And I could go through a litany of things that have changed over the years. And now, it's like almost everything that you stood for back there that was right and decent and respected. I remember a time when I was, I mean, to where we're, we're a, a where men that were pastors or preachers, I mean, they were, there was a, there was a reverence almost. There was a respect that you had for the, the, the pastor and the church and things like that. And a lot of it's been brought on by some individuals that haven't been good. But now we live today, and when, when you see whatever it is on TV, and they're describing or portraying somebody that does what I do, it's like, you know, a dork. You know, it's like a wuss. Honestly, today, one of the best compliments I get is when someone who doesn't know me and then they find out that, that, that I'm senior pastor of Northwest Bible. What I'm saying is this. We're living in a dark day. I've got pictures in my office of my five grandsons, and one of the reasons they're there is because I pray for those boys, because the world that they're growing up in is darker than any time. And you know why? Listen, because the light is being removed. And I'm not talking about the Lord. Jesus said to you and me, did he not? You're the light of the world. So why in the world do we want to live our lives so selfishly? Because, you know, when we live, when we live the typical Christian, consumer-driven, culture-aware life, there's not much brightness to that. But the Lord calls us to a radical abandonment. And that radical abandonment is simply saying, my Jesus, I love you. I know thou art mine. For you all, say the word all. All, all the follies of sin I resign. All the pleasures of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior, art thou forever I love you. My Jesus, tis now. If I say that, I can't say that and mean that. Unless I have come to that place in my life where I realize that the Lord is calling me to a radical abandonment of kin. And he did that. And years ago, it just changed so. I could say it seemed like it changed everything. The way I thought things just started Things I, I would deal with, I didn't have to deal with anymore. You know why? Because I had placed myself as a living sacrifice. And just like the couple that makes that original commitment for the rest of their life, if they're going to have a good marriage, it takes more than a ceremony. And if you're going to be what God wants you to be and know what it is to live a transformed life, it's going to take more than coming to that point when it clicked with me and I agreed and I surrendered myself. It's going to take every day of my life before I ever put my feet on the stinking carpet 
It's not stinking. (laughs) Of saying, Lord, I want to live today. I'm yours. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. I want to glorify you in everything. And I fail. And I'll sin. But God knows my heart. And he'll forgive me if I confess. But every day, to live that life. Because you see what the devil wants to do is he wants to just pull us off of the altar of sacrifice. And God said, don't ever forget the day you stood at the altar in Savannah, Georgia and said those vows to Debbie. And whatever we have in a marriage, I wish everybody could have a marriage like I've got with Debbie, but it's been because, and she gets most of the credit, but it's been because both of us, every day, want to remember the commitments. And for me, I remember the day when I stood at the altar and looked into the face of that girl. And she said, for you, Ken, I'll forsake singleness. And I said to her, I'll forsake singleness. I'll love you. I'll cherish you in sickness and health till death do we part. And I meant it. And now our marriage was defined by our desire. But soon to be 47 years later, though it started at that altar, it is what it will be on June 1st on our anniversary because of day after day, week after week, just remembering what I said to her. I'll love you. I'll honor you. No matter what happens, come hell or high water, I'm with you to the day God takes one of us home. And you know what he wants of my Christian life and your Christian life? He wants us to put ourselves on the altar. And I want to ask you a question, and I want you to be honest. Have you ever... Have you ever, recognizing what God requires, a total abandonment to Him, have you ever ever done that? If not today, not this afternoon, today, right now, is a moment that you can just settle that with God. Every head bowed, every eye closed. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I want to give you just a I want to give you just a little bit of time right now. If you have never come to that point, understanding what Paul was talking about, then right now, in your own words, put yourself on that altar and give yourselves to the Lord. Tell him. You're a living sacrifice for him. Lord, I want to thank you that what the devil throws our way is a bunch of junk and lies. He's not only our enemy, he's our deceiver. I want to thank you, Lord, that when, that when we die to self, that's when we really begin 
to live and know and recognize and experience a growing abundance of life. That's when our marriages can take on a new dimension, our families, our careers. And so, God, I pray and I ask you that we would be men and women in this fellowship who would have a radical commitment to you. It won't make us weird. God, it makes us attractive to a world that is self-centered, without Christ answers to the dilemmas that face them. And may they see within us a vibrancy, a confidence, a security. And Lord Jesus, may they experience through us your love. Because when we place ourselves as a living sacrifice every day, When we really do, and we give you all of ourselves afresh and anew, then we begin to love like you because you love through us. We're dead. And your spirit through us lives the Christian life. Lord, you sort this message out however you need to in each of our lives. And I thank you, God, for the truth of your word, even though at first at times there are things that seem confusing or confounding, huh. but we come to find out when the Spirit of God illuminates your word and we get it, that it just is, it's, it's just crystal clear and it's vibrant. Now unto him, who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and evermore. And everyone said, Amen. I love you folks. Have a wonderful, wonderful afternoon.